everybody. We've still got a little bit of morning left. Uh, I can see people having chats. Resume your seats as you wish. Wander around. That's why we're here in this location. I'm Matthew Wright Simon. I'm very delighted to be hosting this lovely bunch of people. Uh, for you, lovely bunch of people here today. And uh, nice to see you in shady spots and so forth. We're talking about res creative responses to the climate crisis. We've got plenty of time for questions and ruminations on what you've heard from these wonderful creative beings. And if anything's come up from the previous sessions as well that you feel will, you know, add nourishment to the conversation, let's do that too. We've got about three quarters of an hour. The microphone's in the middle as well, so um, I'll mention, you know, a few sort of guidelines around that. You've heard about the QR codes, and I noticed there are a bunch of them on the tables underneath the plane trees. And we've got, you know, best part of an hour to really enjoy one another and find out about some, what's happening with different practitioners and, and what do you people do? And I've really made it pretty loose. So I'm asking people to tell you a bit about themselves. So it's almost like a dating show. So, you know, write your notes, decide who you're particularly keen on and they might be the person you'd like to ask a question. But Caitlin, you're sitting closest to me. Would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a bit about what's your thing? Hi, my name is Caitlin Allen Moore, and I want to acknowledge that we're gathering on the lands of the Ghana people and pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. This land was never ceded, and I feel quite privileged and blessed to be able to tell stories here when their storytellers have been here for much longer than me or any of my ancestors who've been around. Um, so I feel widely inadequate sitting next to these wonderful people, so I'm just going to not look at them for a second. Um, I, my main trade is creative producing. I'm an emerging creative producer, I'm one of Car Clues creative producers this year, and a couple of years ago I started my own company called Weekly Good Productions, which is all about telling weekly good stories through the form of theatre and podcasting. And I think the reason that I'm sitting here is because one of the nice little niches that a lot of the work that I'm working on, the stories that I'm helping to tell, all within the climate crisis, and talking about that in ways that aren't hopefully too scary and overwhelming and kind of bring it down to people in a way that they can understand and connect because art is one of the ways that we can all connect with each other. Uh, so I have a show on at the Fringe called You're All Invited to My Son Samuel's Fourth Birthday Party, which might be the longest title in the Fringe. <laughs> if you have another one, please let me know and I will fight them very politely in a car park. <laughs> and that's about looking at the climate crisis in the framework of a four-year-old's birthday party, which is probably the last place you would think about it, but it's absolutely relevant. Um, yeah, so creative producer foremost, a writer secondly, I write a lot of poetry, I'm a little shitty poet, as I like to refer to myself, no, I refer to myself as a spoken word artist, and if you recognise my face, it might have been on an open mic stage. And in my poetry I talk a lot about human connection and the earth and mythology and all that kind of stuff, and yes, I think that's all I want to say about myself. That's a wonderful Great. way. Thank you. Lovely to meet you. And yeah, being here in Ganyap is such a privilege and lovely to be welcomed here by Uncle Mickey. So we're in a good good spot. Ali, would you like to share a little bit about yourself? Hi everyone. My name's Ali Kumiga Baker and my family come from the west coast of South Australia. My nana was um, born at a place called Fowler's Bay and my great grandmother was born at a place called Eucla, and we're learning from the Nullarbor that I've grown up on Ghana country, and I want to acknowledge um, Ghana Yada, I want to acknowledge Sanda Nyanga, and that, that we're actually sitting as well in a, in a mine site here, uh, where it dips down. Um, Uncle Lewis, I remember him t talking to me about how this site was quarried to build Old Parliament House and that this site here where it comes down is um, a spot, a sacred Ghana place and so I wanted to kind of tune in to the fact that um, for my old people and for the communities that I've grown up in, um, chaos descended upon us a long time ago and the chaos and the kind of 
crisis that we're experiencing at the moment is a continuation of uh, a crisis which descended upon my great-grandmother um, when she was living in the desert. And for our communities, that's, that discomfort is a place that we occupy and yeah, I wanted to acknowledge that. But I'm also an academic at Flinders University. I teach in to Indigenous and Australian studies. I mainly teach um, non-Indigenous students across a range of degree programs, um, Indigenous histories. I teach, uh, I've studied a degree in visual arts, an honours degree in visual arts in the 90s. Um, I've, I've done a master's in screen studies in filmmaking and then a PhD in cultural studies. But I've always been looking at my family's relationship to that knowledge. And I'm also part of a collective of Aboriginal um, women uh, academic artists called the Armband Collective. And my sister girls are Simona Logater, who's young Gunjara, Natalie Harkin, who's a poet, who's Narunga, Faye Roses Blanche, who's Yidinjidma Barbaram from African Tablelands. And so part of our work is really kind of thinking about collectivity and how ideas can, what ideas bind us together and what ideas might set us free. And how do we understand scholarship and thinking in relation to action. So we do, we have done a series of sovereign acts and we're interested in kind of that process. So I'll, yeah, I'll pass over to Debbie no, tomorrow. No, that's great, it's beautiful, <laughs> yeah. rich territory. Yeah, yeah. please. Um, and Tamara, I know your, your uh, practice is, is very grounded in working with a collective as well. So share a bit about so yourself, Tamara. Sure. My name's Tamara Bailey and I'm a primarily a visual artist, mostly work in sculpture and installation. Um, and today I'm here as a representative of yet another visual arts collective. Um, we just call ourselves SA Artists for Climate Action. And we are myself, Sunni Boone, Zoe Frenny, Sarah Waters, and Gigi Barton Sane, and I think I was sitting way down the end there, so hello. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm sort of speaking for myself as well as our, our group today. I think that's, our group was invited to speak and I was the person that had time to, to come along. Um, and that's sort of how our group got started. Um, we were all having similar conversations and we were all um, already making art about some of these issues that we've heard speakers talk about this morning and that I'm, I'm sure we're all well aware of about some of the crises facing us at the moment. And um, you know, we were making art from the place of what are our personal responses, but also some of us make work about the legacy of the settler colonial cultures that we, we specifically have here in South Australia, um, in Australia, um, and what we could do about those sorts of things or how we can uncover new ways of connecting with that. Um, but we're also getting really frustrated with the lack of political action, with the lack of leadership in these areas, with the lack of resource allocation, um, and as busy individuals that were, you know, straddling creative practice and day jobs and responsibilities to other people, we felt powerless to really create that change that we see the, the intense need for. Um, so we just started having a conversation together about what could we do that might effect some change greater than we individually could create. Um, and, you know, we're still extremely tiny. <laughs> One of my big ground rules is no more admin because nobody has time for another organisation or another web page or another committee to be on. Um, and so we just started thinking what are simple things that we could get people to do. Um, and uh, we have been trying to kind of push forward with that as well um, and come up with new ways to, to highlight that and to use creativity to build connection um, and to try to drive some change in the sector. Thank you, Tamara. And I understand a bit about um, not too much admin. Uh, um, Tamara also works in the medical professions and uh, I don't know how you fit everything in, to be completely honest. Uh, so, uh, reducing admin is an excellent aspiration. David, would you like to share a bit about yourself uh, as a person and artist? Sure. Um, my name is David Finnegan. I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm a settler from, uh, born and raised on Ngunnawal country in the southeast, uh, which is Canberra, the city of Canberra. Um, so, really grateful to be here today. Thank you so much, Ali, for placing us 
in this specific context. It's yeah, an honour to be here speaking with you all. I'm a playwright and theatre maker. So my practice is I write and create different kinds of theatre, usually in collaboration with researchers. So I work a lot with climate scientists, different sort of earth system scientists, and I make shows that look at different aspects of climate and global change. So projects and performances that, that look at the big changes that are taking place on the planet today. Um, and that's all I'll say about that for now. Thank you. And you're getting the sirens as well. Thank you, David. <laughs> Perfect timing with the word crisis. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I think we're getting to know one another a, a little bit as well. And uh, I set a little bit of a task, and I'm curious, actually, to see what emerges from it. So each of these artists has uh, been encouraged to bring a thing. So something that an object or something that relates to the work they're doing and also to help you engage with, with some of their creative practice. And so I, I hope, um, now I've been given a sequence because there are some images that will come up on this fancy LED screen here that hopefully you'll be able to see and hopefully uh, you people viewing from the future on the recorded version can also see it. I hope the future's better, by the way. Um, please let us know if it is, um, I'll see you in the past. So uh, let's have a look at uh, David, what your thing is. This is like a children's show, isn't it? Lovely. What's your thing? Uh, so I picked a credit card. Uh, you'll notice it's, I don't know if it's a legit credit card. You can try, you can try uh, <laughs> using that number and seeing, seeing what you can buy. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure what to pick, but I, I went with a credit card, I think because uh, of that lovely, extraordinary University of Newcastle study from 2017, which, uh, which revealed that we each consume about a credit card's worth of plastic every week. Um, that's on average. So maybe you, you probably eat a bit more if you eat much. If you eat a lot of seafood, maybe a little bit less if you eat uh, veg primarily vegetarian. But all of us have in our bodies right now like a significant amount of plastic. And I feel like plastic pollution is one of these things that that sort of situates us. We talk a lot about climate crisis, and I think that's the the framework that we the the, the most easy to hand framework that we have for thinking about the big transformations happening to the planet. But of course, climate's just one of the big changes that we're going through, and um, you know, the the transformation to land, the transformation to the oceans, uh, all of these things are, are huge, maybe even more significant. The mass extinctions that are going on—they're not technically climate change, but they might be even more significant in the long run of things. And plastic pollution is another one, which I think is really in the last ten years, the conversation around plastic kind of blew up almost out of nowhere. I feel like five five years ago. If you'd said microplastics to me, I would have been like, yeah, what's that? And now I think we're really all on the front foot about, we understand that this huge volume of plastic has gone into the atmosphere, has gone into the, the biosphere since the 50s, and hasn't gone anywhere. It's sort of, you know, all the plastic we ever have, it just degrades into this incredibly fine sand, and it eventually makes its way into the ocean, where it makes its way into copepods and small crustaceans, and then up the food chain to fish, to seals, to whales, and to us. And then it stays here. And I think, for me, it's a, it's a quite destabilizing and, and unbalancing thing to think that me and you and all of us here today, right now, we have more plastic in our bodies than any human being in any generation before us in the history of the planet. And that's weird, right? Like, that's, that's a sort of strange thing. But also, like, for me, it's, it's normal. I don't think about it. Like, what does it feel like to be more full of plastic than any human being that's ever come before you? we kind of, well, I kind of don't think about it most of the time. And that, I suspect, is how a lot of the, the crisis that we're in, we process. You know, we were born in the middle of this crisis, we'll die in the middle of this crisis. Crisis is all around us, it's always been all around us. So how do you even point to it? Um, yeah, that's why I think uh, it's such a strange and, and fascinating moment, as well as being terrifying and, and deeply saddening. Fantastic, yeah, that's, I definitely deserve sleep. <laughs> Uh, and of course, uh, the availability of credit has uh, really accelerated our consumption, including the plastic byproducts. That, that's amazing to think. I mean, what could we make with all of the plastic in us? It's quite extraordinary to think about. And later on today as well, Bakebridge have got a performance, uh, an artwork um, collaboration coming together that involves Plastic Green Industries SA, are one of the partners here, and they're involved uh, quite a bit with helping develop the policy and the legislation that remove single-use plastic from South Australia. So uh, it's a fantastic choice, and I didn't know what you were going to put up there, so that's a, 
a great start. Ali, what's your thing that you've brung to us? Um, oh, I've got an image, but... Oh, yes, um, yeah. I made him move. <laughs> Can people see that image? That's my sister girl, Faye, and it's, um, she's holding a coral piece that I've made, I found, I buy most of my things from the op shop and I found a basket full of coral and we were, we'd been talking a lot about um, the kind of, where the phase is from, Yidinjima, Barbaran countries, rainforest country, it's a little bit in, from the Great Barrier Reef, but the rivers are being, there's a lot of um, mining going on and a lot of poisoning of the rivers that she swam in as a child and those rivers run out into the ocean. And we've been, I guess, talking to our dear friend as well, Katerina Tiwa, who works at ANU, who's from the Kiribati Islands, which was mined to the point where the indigenous peoples there had to be, she was moved. And, and the, the phosphate was, scattered all over this country, superphosphate fertiliser, and we actually have her islands in our bones because phosphate. So we're just talking about fragments mm -hmm. and about the ways that water carries fragments. And I guess it connects to microplastics as well. Um, but it also, it's named Loophole Shelter because it also relates to a Tina Camp um, poem which is really relating to this a slave narrative of a woman who escaped a, a, a black American woman who escaped slavery and dwelled in a cavity of a roof in a tiny little space and she occupied this tiny space she held space in order to be free and I guess we're in this kind of precarious kind of space where we are deeply, well, it's deeply distressing, but it's also incredibly beautiful and important. Like, so the dead coral is really beautiful, but it's also, in, you know, so it's this kind of possibility of finding shelter in, on, an, on an earth that is so incredibly beautiful and it's a, such an honor to be here and to be part of a continuum of living, once living, future living, non-living. Anyway, that's what I... Yeah, uh, also, by the way, following this event, um, if you're very interested, of course you're interested in the work of these artists, there will be links uh, to various things that are being held or exhibitions and performances that they've had and perhaps some other resources that can be linked to as well because towards the end of this session as well there'll be things that you can do yourselves including engaging with amazing art so thank you Ali uh, we've got, got next on my list Caitlin what's your thing um, so my thing is <laughs> it's essentially a mug tree um, that I have in my apartment and it's like this metal sort of, I think it's made out of um, recycled and reused metal and I have a whole bunch of mugs hanging on it. And the reason that I chose this, um, for those listening at home, it's like kind of a brown sort of metal and it looks like an umbrella stand but flipped around and there's a whole bunch of mugs, a lot of Star Wars mugs, let's be honest, hanging from it. And the reason that I chose this is because one of the very first things that I have to do as a creative producer is have a conversation with the artist that I'm working with. And that usually happens over a table, which is also pictured here, with a couple of mugs chosen from this mug tree, um, from a ridiculous collection of tea that I somehow have, despite not being a very big tea drinker. And every single project that I've worked on and every script that I've read has been accompanied by a mug from this tree. So the reason that I chose this was just to kind of show how a lot of the work that I do is about conversations, it starts with a conversation, it's carried through with a conversation because as a producer your kind of aim is to 
help the artist tell the story that they want to tell, and that means having conversations with them so that hopefully they can have a conversation with an audience member who can then have a conversation with someone else. I think you get the point I'm making. And a lot of those conversations happen over something that you can hold and feel grounded to and drink. Um, so it's quite literal and quite important to me because it's also a bit of a bit that everyone who comes in, they're like, oh, I'm like, would you like to have a tea? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, great, pick a mug. And because there's at least 30 of them, it almost becomes a personality test. <laughs> and then they pick a tea and it becomes this whole constructed, constructed framework for us to have a conversation and figure out what they want to tell. And recently it's been around the climate. Um, and I think it was something that was spoken about in the last talk, if you were still here, which I'm going to echo, is that one of the things we need to do is continue to have conversations, whether they be gentle or loud, or over a cup of tea. Um, or coffee, which is my preferred drink of choice. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm very much enjoying this, and <laughs> it's, um, as we go on with our show and tell tomorrow, what's uh, what's the thing that uh, you brought for us today? Uh, well, a little greedy, and I've actually brought two things. So oh, what? <laughs> both of these are climate badges, okay? And I wanted to bring more than one because there's no right way to do a climate badge. Um, but this is one of the sort of key projects that we've been doing um, as a collective is asking people to make a badge to send to somebody that you believe is doing important work on the climate crisis. And somebody that maybe is doing that in the face of maybe not universal support or maybe some significant challenges or maybe is, you know, has been doing it for a while. Um, and not necessarily just people that are in the public eye either. And I think um, our whole sort of um, idea around this was to actually just build a little bit more connection between people that are doing this work and not through official channels, but just as human beings, as somebody that can draw a picture, cut out some felt and put on some sticky letters uh, and a, a safety pin on the back uh, and address an envelope um, to somebody and just you know, that little pat on the back that we all need from time to time. Um, but also the thoughtful moment for yourself <laughs> to just think about, you know, noticing people that are making those efforts um, and just saying, you know, I see you and thank you in a small way. Um, so yeah, we've sent them to uh, all kinds of people from local councillors and people that run volunteer ecology groups um, through to, um, you know, documentary filmmakers and national politicians and international politicians. Um, so yeah, we just really encourage people to, to do what they feel is a connection to, basically. And there is no instruction kit. There is no how to do it. <laughs> just do it, however you feel that you need to do it. It'd be really nice if you post it on social media somewhere with a hashtag. Um, but you don't need to. You can just do it. That's fine. And the um, hashtag and is? Climate badges. <laughs> um, um, so yeah. Thank you, Tom. Um, actually, there's one quite well-known person who received one who does a bit of work on the telly. Uh, Attenborough? But yes. I get them all confused. Was it David, David Attenborough? Yes. <laughs> um, and Zoe actually sent off a badge to David Attenborough and got a lovely handwritten letter back, which was amazing. Like that, you know, it's not always a one-way flow. Um, quite a few people have received letter of thanks um, and photos of people wearing them at you know public events and things like that. So, um, yeah. But if I can give a shout out, if anybody has an address for Missy Higgins, we've had quite a lot of trouble finding a mailing address. So let me know afterwards. All right, it's a Missy mission. Get on it. Uh, and if you haven't done so already, I know that Tamara is not big on admin, but I'd like you to think of somebody and pop their name down and make a commitment to helping encourage somebody who you think is wonderful, who somehow keeps going. And I think that's just such a lovely grassroots thing with minimal admin uh, that everybody can be part of. And yeah, so thank you, Tamara. So I really enjoyed hearing that and I wish I'd asked you all to bring a thing so we could all be um, sharing these lovely little vignettes from life. All right, so part of, the, one more thing before I actually open to, to you uh, fine people about what your creative responses to the climate crisis might be is, is really uh, to maybe look at a bit of the hard stuff. 
and the relationship of creativity, the relationship of art to this global existential crisis, you know, we're full of plastic, uh, we're here, you know, in an increasingly warming planet, we all know about it. And I wondered if I might, um, just on this occasion, David, if you might have a particular point of view in the relationship between, uh, I'm sorry, I apologise, <laughs> I'm not getting a badge from David. Um, yeah, I just don't know uh, what I've done to wrong you. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you said something really interesting in our discussions about where art might fit or not fit when it comes to something like the climate crisis. That was what I was thinking about. Yeah, I think I was. I think I was struggling a bit with the, a little bit of panic around the the content of the the topic of this of this talk, um, art's contribution to the to the climate crisis. Um, essentially, I'm not sure that it. I'm not sure that it can. I'm not sure that it does. I have a feeling uh, that art and artists love to talk about art's contribution to climate crisis, to other big events. Um, I'm an artist, I love to think that art can change the world, has changed the world, will change the world. But I feel like that in my lifetime, the evidence for that has been pretty thin on the ground. And I certainly think, you know, when it comes to something like uh, COVID, for example, I remember at the very beginning of the pandemic a couple of years ago, there was a, a wave of conversations about like, what's art's response gonna be to the pandemic? Speaking as a theater maker, I spent two years unable to make work, unable to practice. And uh, I don't think art particularly contributed to that, uh, to that crisis, to any of the ways that we responded or, or survived through it. I feel like I at least was very downstream from that. And for theater and the arts, I feel like I've often been asked, well, what's art doing? How is art changing? What is art gonna, how is art gonna help us solve the crisis or through the crisis? And my, my feeling, and it is just, I don't have hard facts for this, but I feel like we're in a crisis, we're in the climate era. We're making art in the crisis, but I'm not sure that the connection is as strong as maybe I'd like it to be, or other people have argued that it is. Yeah, thank I'm, you, David. I'm holding back from saying that I think that art is useless. <laughs> you didn't hold back. <laughs> um, thank you, David. And I was hoping that you'd share some of that because I think it's—I uh, think we all experience doubt in anything that we do. And uh, I've heard this this thread of collectivism coming through. But you're all actually not creating art solo. You're sharing it with others. So there's certain things in that and we're here all together in this conversation uh, so it's great to, to think about that and I actually just want to you know throw it out there is, does anyone have anyone have anyone else here on stage want to say something I absolutely agree and I think we all face that and in ourselves every day like every time you go to the studio it's like why am I wasting my time here you know I've got to pay my rent I've got emails to answer whatever it is I think that's a, a, a personal challenge all the time um, but I think you know in that kind of conversation that you're talking about, like can, can art be used for what art's response is going to be? I think, you know, that's very much at the macro level and I just try to bring it back to, I am an individual and what can I do personally and for me to have a life? And I think, you know, the panel before us was, was speaking very much about this, about being connected with yourself, being connected with the community and being connected with country. And the way that I can do that is through creative expression in balance with all my other responsibilities, but I think that's a really important part of all of our lives um, for ourselves. Maybe not to, to come up with a solution to the climate crisis necessarily, but as a way of connecting um, and getting back into the heart space that people were talking about before as well, um, and, and just more as a personal experience of being alive rather than trying to come up with the answer to something that's clearly well beyond any one solution. Caitlin, is there anything you wanted to? Um, I think it's also about keeping the conversation on the table. I was having a conversation with someone the other day who talked about um, watershed and the idea that they could tell their parent that they were going to see that and it was a show about queer issues and gay issues and that was a framework that they could then safely talk about that. But any time that they had tried to bring it up previously, their parent had shut them down and be like, we don't want to talk about that, blah, blah, blah. And I think you can apply the same thing to the climate crisis where people feel safe talking about art. And if you can talk about the climate crisis in a framework that like, oh, but we're actually talking about this show, opens up the space to talk about it to then actually talk about the issue itself, which is 
very much the first or second step in terms of talking and trying to figure out how to survive this. Um, so I think there's something in creating a space to talk about it, but also creating a space where we're wildly shouting about it so it can't be left behind and no longer in the narrative, which is why like media is so important and media is a form of art. If you're able to talk about it there, then it's still on the forefront of people's minds in a way. But at the same time, a lot of that pressure is being put on artists who particularly in theatre and especially in Australia where like, we don't even have a proper arts policy and there's no funding or relief to support us, let alone in the climate crisis, but even a pandemic that is still going and is still affecting work. Um, how do we continue to talk about this in a way when we're literally fighting to just pay bills? I agree with um, everyone. I, I guess I moved away from making work because I thought that the kind of individualism and ego after I left art school was too much. And I just thought it was a very superficial thing to do. But at the same time, the way that I found just being able to be moved by um, the indeterminate. And I guess. You know, I see so much leadership um, in our society is around being sure and and this very um, white individualist, masculine kind of uh, determinism that is leading us down this path which uh, forgets the indeterminate, forgets the, the tentative, the emotional, the everything that is is part of what it means to be human and or to be to have life and and it's not just about humanism either it's actually it's that interconnectedness that we um that indigenous peoples have always understood that everything is interconnected and i guess the fragmentation of that and how we tell our stories is really really important so whether or not it's classified as art, storytelling is the only way we are going to transform our communities. Um, we have to be able to collectively understand um, value and revalue ourselves and our worlds in different kinds of ways, but also find a way to live with the grief or the, the pain of what is I, I want to be able to grieve as well because I feel as though there's not. We need to be able to be be alive. And I look at. Um, I'm a mum and I'm also a teacher and a university lecturer, and they're both very. They require me to not be cynical. I cannot be cynical. It's not my right to enter that space with cynicism. So I need to be able to come into the space and um, offer, offer um, con thoughtful engagement. But, you know, it's not all sunshine and hugs. My 14-year-old my is telling me all the time about how angry and upset they feel about where we're at. And I agree with that. So, so how do we express that? What's what's peaceful dialogue or what's radical peaceful change look like and for that that really needs a lot of conversation yeah uh, ali can i ask your um your work in terms of sort of thinking about interconnectivity and so on the piece that we were just talking about before we came on stage at the museum right now about uh, the rivers is that kind of an example of this uh, a work that that places interconnectivity at the heart yeah so we were just um uh, we've got a piece at MOD, and it's about Carol Rapari. And we've been working with Ghana collaborators, so Ghana poets, who've written about how they feel about the these plains, the wetlands of the earth, a lot of which in the West have been turned into concrete chains, for example. A lot of the kind of... The, the, so how do you deal with 
kind of buy, or, or the, the river that I grew up near in Salisbury, Little Parawira, is now completely dead. Like, we used to catch the abbeys there 30 years ago and look at them in buckets, and then we would release them back into the, the creek. And these are spirit of country. These creeks um, are enormously important. So we were just talking about our relationship to the place where we live and how, what we could do locally. So, yeah. That was part of it was kind of like thinking about kind of knowledge about these places and then telling stories mm -hmm. that actually acknowledge um, that this devastation is happening right in front of us. Like I, I wept when I read an artist who was an honest student. She'd done a water study of the Little Power River and found that there was no, there was nothing living in there, and I just. I didn't know what to do about that. You know, in the 80s, that's where we, it was magical and I knew it was, and I knew that it was really important. And I didn't know what to do with that knowledge, except for we need to talk about that. And we also need to think about what does renewal look like if microplastics have infiltrated every single ecosystem on the planet. They're in Antarctica, they're in the deep ice, they're everywhere. Like that is really, that makes me really, really upset. But at the same time, I, you know, so there's this kind of space you've got to occupy where you feel really angry or upset or whatever it is, but we need to be able to also, it's, it's a really beautiful day here today. You know, like it is, like I have to tell my, I don't want my, my daughter to feel as though there's nothing to be here for. In our community, in Aboriginal communities, we have really high suicide rates. You know, look, I don't want, I want, so, you know, and it, but it's not shangri la. So that's that kind of reality check. I don't know how to, you know. And did them um, when you sort of saw sort of this, heard the story about the Dead River, and were like, you, you didn't know how to talk about this. Has this provided a space to, yeah? What what's changed through doing this project? So we want. Yeah, we want to do some more community-based work around working with those rivers. But what you also find, and I've met with river scientists who, it's part of the issue of modernity that we've got a fragmented society. So we've got river scientists who look at particular aspects of particular rivers, but the complex whole isn't being spoken about by anyone in bureaucracy. The complex whole of our planet, the complex, the the importance, the fundamental underlying importance of that complex whole. You can look at one little spot here, there and everywhere and focus on that, but it also requires those big, the big vision, the big ideas need to be continued to be talked about. We need to have really big philosophical conversations about what does it mean to be here at this time and what is our, what is the kind of what do, what do we share in terms of our values going forward and how do we want to live ethically in relation to each other and ourselves and the planet? You know, that's fundamental. Thank, thank you so much. You're, you're really opening those questions up and I, I remember discussing with both you and Caitlin, what do we do with these feelings? What do we do with this knowledge and acknowledging all of you with that, and I, I hope you'll humour me here. I, I really want to hear from you. There's a microphone in the middle, but first of all, uh, if if it's comfortable for you to do so, if you could actually stand up, uh, just it's a very momentary thing. If we could do that, I, I've got a microphone blocking my way, but if you could just stand up. Uh, and what I'd like you to do, because you've heard a lot of big stuff here, and you're probably feeling a lot. So I want you to breathe in and then just let out your best version of a growl or a sigh or whatever it might be. We can do it up here, should we do it? Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. Here we go, breathe in and growl. <sighs> All right. Okay, now before you sit down, I want you to get your hands and I want you to smack yourself on the bum. Okay, just to get some blood into your buttocks. All right, you've been sitting there for a while, okay? And if you don't feel like sitting down, you can walk up to the microphone and ask a question of one of these fine people. Or uh, if you do, I'd like you to direct a question to one of the individuals. And if you don't remember their name, just you know, point to them. And if you don't have a particular person in mind to answer the question, then I'm sure people on the panel 
We'll do it, okay. With tingling buttocks, we'll wait for a question from you. Please introduce yourself as well, I'd love to know your name. Um, I'm Vera from Sydney, and when I saw that credit card picture on the wall, I remembered my mother, who I've been thinking of a lot because um, she was born in Kiev, Ukraine, before World War I. Anyway, <laughs> and um, we're in Australia, courtesy to her, but she lived her life in performance art, and I remember decades ago when they sent out these new things called credit cards, she was so furious, she hadn't asked for it. She demanded I take her to the bank that sent it to her, and in the middle of the bank, she had her scissors ready and she cut it up into pieces <laughs> and threw it at me. And I, I was quite often embarrassed about my mother's behavior starting off as a child when we'd go to the shops and she would ask for sex apples in her accent. And I would beg her to say half a dozen apples. <laughs> anyway, there I have my mother like that figure. I also have a few people I call my fairy godmother. One of them, you know, would take the trolley through Manly where she lived and collect everybody's rubbish and have signs up, you know, this is today's, um, you know, unsorted rubbish or whatever. So there are ways of being a performance artist without being called an artist, you know, living your life as a performance about what you believe. So um, the question is, how do we go back to that simplicity of living? And my, one of my other fairy godmothers, she had a sign on her wall, live simply so that others can simply live. And she lived like that. She was an example of that kind of living. So how do we go back from not having the credit cards, the, you know, the over shopping, the everything like that? Thank you, Vera. I'd please, um, I'd like, um, you to thank Vera for her reflections and, and her question. Uh, your mum sounds amazing. Does anyone feel inspired to share something in response here? Tamara? Oh, Caitlin, <laughs> Sophie, you're nodding at Caitlin. Sophie. Um, I don't think we can, to be completely honest. I think it is lovely and something that I wish that we could, but I think the world that we're in now, because of the structures that it has created within, we just can't. And I think what we need to figure out instead of figuring out how to live simply is how do we live, yeah, how do we live cleanly and greenly and how do we live with it in a way that is actually serving us rather than us serving it and flipping it, because unless we have a full on revolution um, and have a plan after that revolution, how do we flip it in a way that it is greener and is more constructive and holistic and working with each other rather than against each other? I wish that we could, but I don't think that we can live simply anymore. Yeah. I think that we need to engage in um, new kinds of um, praxis, new kinds of ceremony with each other that takes us away from that feeling that we need to consume continually. And I think that you know, people have talked about it. It's about um, moving away from a kind of individualism that has come with colonialism. And it's thinking about uh, collective responsibilities in different kinds of ways from my perspective. And that's multiple, that, that can happen in multiple ways, but it needs to be happening continually. I think also um, a lot of us do have so much information coming in now. I think that is actually a bit of a problem, like how to filter that out, what sources are coming from. Nobody has time to fact check properly all of that. So, yeah, so I think sort of making time to be connected with yourself and your own immediate community. So if you define that, whether that's online or your neighbours or whoever your climate badge recipients, um, then I think, I think that's one way through it. But I tend to agree, I don't know that we're going to get back to some kind of simplicity, I think the, the momentum is there, the structures are there, we just have to find ways through it. Yeah, yeah I'd agree, even if even if we, we stop now and, and obviously emit nothing more from this moment on and, and all of us um, move to a, a simpler mode of living that isn't damaging the earth in the way that it has and, and does, um, 
we've still got a huge volume of, of greenhouse gases that we've emitted, which we're yet to see the impact of. So when I was born, uh, parts per million were, were it was 343 parts per million in the early 80s, carbon dioxide. Um, today, now it's 419 parts per million carbon dioxide in the air that we're breathing. And that already puts us in a kind of future that we haven't seen yet. We've kind of already, you know, that takes about maybe 30 to 50 years to sort of filter the, the greenhouse gases we emit will we'll kind of enter the atmosphere, they'll be drawn into the ocean, they'll take between sort of three and five decades before we see their impacts. And so we're facing now the impacts, the floods in, in the East Coast, the fires, the kinds of impacts that we're facing today are from emissions that we made back in the 80s. And we've escalated the impact, the emissions in the last 30, 40 years. We're emitting now so much more. So even if we stop, we need to draw down this carbon and no one, has a plan for how to draw down this carbon. It's kind of this whole language of geoengineering, which you know a lot of the time is being used as a smokescreen by, by companies in order to continue emitting. But we need to figure out how to do it. We need to figure out how to do it in a way that's just, in a way that is community-led, in a way that puts uh, people in control of, this, of these processes who have traditionally not been in control. Um, we haven't even got the beginnings of a system that would allow us to do that. We need to invent that. And no, there is no example for what that looks like. We're gonna have to figure it out in our lifetimes. Um, we're gonna have to become something that, that you know, we've never seen before in order to get through this century without some serious wounds as a species. Um, I don't know what that looks like, I don't think, um, but I don't think it, it can be any kind of return. Um, yeah. Thank you, David. And uh, I think what we might do here, because um, people are patiently waiting, we might do one question, and if you just want to reflect on something, that's fine. Uh, if you have a question, one person can catch it, and then we'll move to the next one. And if we deplete the resources of questions in the next 10 or so minutes, then um, we can riff off it. How's that sound? We're good? And please, when you do, um, please introduce yourself uh, when you walk up to that microphone. Thanks very much. Uh, my name's Jeffrey from Melbourne. I'm a physician. I've been interested in climate change for about 10 years now. And we have heard all week about the pathetic lack of leadership in our politicians in this country. So I forgive them, we don't need to talk about that again. Um, we know it's true. Um, we've heard a lot about changing the political uh, spectrum and that's true. Um, what I wanted to reflect on was, I think it was Ali who said, there's too much suicide in her community. And there's also a massive amount of anxiety and depression in the community about climate change. Uh, we're seeing people at the last talking about how we uh, mitigate climate change, and that's uh, we're all working on that, which is important. But I just wonder, this today we're talking about creative responses. Is it too much to ask if we can have not only hope but also positive roadmaps uh, going forward from people like yourself, not talking about gloom and doom and catastrophizing everything, but saying this is the future and we can do it positively. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Would any of you like to respond? Or we're all good? Or I'm happy? You're happy? Caitlin? You all invited somebody from Samuel's fourth birthday party. You feel dread, but you feel gentler leaving it. Um, there are people talking about it positively, which is great. Um, and one of the things that Matt asked us to do at the end um, <laughs> is resources. And there's a whole bunch of places, particularly on social media, that are focusing on the positivities of it rather than all the doom and gloom. Because there are some really cool things happening in terms of the climate crisis and that movement. Um, there's this one Instagram called Future Earth where I think it's either once a month every Tuesday or, or, or every Tuesday they have Good News Tuesdays and specifically highlighting the good things that have been happening. Because there are some good things. Um, just needs to happen a little bit quicker. But it's... Interesting you're talking about eco-anxiety and eco-grief because it's a brand new term that has kind of jumped up in the last, what, five years. Um, and as a young person, so I'm 25, I think most of my peers outside of queerness, um, when it comes to their mental health, it's about the climate crisis and facing these big things that we've never had to face before as a generation and the generation after us have it even worse. Um, but the way that we talk about it and the way that we make art about it, at least in my circles, is one in this way of like, here are all the big scary things that we all know, but how do we talk about it in a way that makes us overcome our grief and anxiety? Not, not overcome it, but use it as a tool for change and for good and for this positivity. 
Um, but with a healthy dose of, we're really mad about this. Um, so I think it's about balancing the two and using art as an outlet for that in both grief and rage and positivity. Thanks, Kate. Yeah. I hope that uh, helps, Jeffrey. And, and thank you for mentioning we'll have an audio show bag of uh, suggestions from uh, from our panellists uh, on some of the things that you can do, and that of course can be shared as, as links as well. Um, yeah, who, who, uh, who are you? What have you got to say? Hi, I'm Yasmin. Um, Caitlin, you touched on this with a comment about pain break, or like anxiety about pain break. Um, and I was just curious on your thoughts about the interaction of privilege or lack of privilege and making art and climate change. Also, within that, like specifically, I make theatre, I do theatre things, and theatre is a an art form that I think is hard to make cheaply, and also hard to make in a climate-conscious way cheaply. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great. These are the things I think about weekly. Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Processing. Um, I think it's something that you have to go into all of your projects thinking about, particularly like I have privilege as a white person, I have privilege as someone who was born female and identifies as female, um, and because we're in Adelaide, a lot of us are white, we're the second whitest city in Australia, and a lot of people live with their privilege and I think it's about acknowledging and checking it and knowing that the climate crisis affects everyone but particularly in Australia, you have First Nations voices at the forefront of that in whichever way that you can. And in an independent theatre space, it's tricky to balance that in a way that you are able to afford to make art, but then also physically pay the rent, whilst paying your own rent at the same time. Um, so I think my thoughts on it are that it's complex and nuanced, and one of the ways that I'm trying to approach it in my theatre producing is looking at ways that it becomes intrinsic to the work. So if you're creating a theatre space, how is it intrinsically green? Is everyone bringing cube cups? How are we travelling? What is the internet usage that we're doing and the amount of emissions that that gives off? And having that from day dot. And the same way of, is there an organisation that we can partner with that focus on First Nations? Or is it a story that needs that interpretation? Or am I not the person who should be talking about it because it isn't mine and my privilege affords me that? Um, yeah, I think it's just, there's something about a good space that it's kind of happening in is around access and aesthetic access and how do you automatically build it into the work, which is hard in an independent theatre space and it's about being able to do it to the best of your ability with the people that you have, but then also calling on bigger theatre spaces like Adelaide Festival and say Theatre Company and Patch and Windmill and all the other ones to be like, great, what are you doing? Because at the moment it's a lot on the independent theatre people and we can't afford to. So it's about putting pressure on them whilst also putting pressure on yourself and your peers. Those are my thoughts. Talk to me, Andrew. There are so yeah. many of them. <laughs> thank, thank you, Yasmin, and thank you, Caitlin. And, and also, uh, I think everyone's going to be sort of hanging around a little bit, or a lot. And so if you do want to strike up a conversation or form a collaboration with anyone here on stage, then, you know, game on. Uh, please, I'd love to hear what you've got to say. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Alex from beautiful Manoa Mamre country in Canberra. And my, my comment and question really is to, to you, um, as well as all of the panel. And my heart broke a bit when you questioned about how art could help. Um, just a bit of a background, I've spent um, six years running the National Museums and Galleries Association. And um, so of course, it was in the thick of the whole pandemic response. And it was, it was um, tragic, the inadequate response, inadequate is not the right word, but we will be polite here, uh, of the Commonwealth Government and saw the states and territories stepped up. But your quest art actually kept most of us sane. Okay? We actually read and watched and, and responded. That is what kept people around the world um, sane and human. So never ever question the value and responsibility of that. Secondly, culture and arts is broader than, I mean, theatre is wonderful, of course, but it's much, much broader. Just look at the work, the amazing work um, that Kim was talking about um, in MOD, you know, with the museums and galleries sector, huge. The relationship with science, um, absolutely critical. So, um, 
So when you ask um, how big things change, um, leading on from the fact that arts and culture kept the same and humane, and we know that legal and political change comes from people, that we actually have to do that, so we know that that's from our own hearts and our own strength and our own commitments. So the question back to you guys as, as practicing artists is what sort of art and conversations can help the most to actually energize people to make those changes and demand those changes that actually deal with the biggest structural problems that are impeding the whole conversation, the big complex issues that we're talking about. Fantastic, thank you Alex. Okay, let her rip, come on. <laughs> Um, never question that the arts uh, can have a. Can you say that again? I oh, know. Turn your microphone off. Go, go again. They get the same and humane. I, I question it every day. I question it every single day, every project. I completely. I live in doubt. I I suspect a lot of artists do. I don't think. Um, yeah, I. I completely agree that art kept the same, but I also think for the huge majority of the world, it wasn't the arts as we understand it, it wasn't even the kind of cultural sector as you're describing it, it was probably a very small number of mainstream, capitalist-driven arts as products that were broadcast media out to the world. I don't think it was us kind of engaging in the in the low-key kind of community-to-community uh, -community connectivity that, that I love and I think that we all love. I think a lot of it was actually people watching Netflix. And that is art, that's absolutely art, but I don't, it, and it, it qualifies as culture for sure. But in terms of what is the most effective kind of art for producing change, it's a really great question, but I also think we, we, we probably do ourselves a disservice by putting it on artists to answer that question. By which I mean, you're absolutely right. So politics and, and law uh, is where a lot of this change has to be driven from. That is shaped by people's demands, it's also shaped by the economy and by technology, but putting those aside, it's, it's shaped by people's behavior and people's demands, and people's behavior and demands are shaped by culture. So yes, at some point, the arts begins there. But I think if you say to an artist, and I know it because I've, I've had it said to me for 20 years from scientists primarily, but also policymakers and other people, NGOs, they're like, okay, so what's the, you need to make a piece of art that's gonna change people's behavior, change people's minds, change people's attitudes, and I've made some really bad art from that premise. And I think a lot of the art that begins on that premise is bad. I think what we'll tend to do, historically, is we'll tend to look at art in the art that was made decades ago, and we'll tend to apply this lens of, well, huge social change was happening, and there was this piece of art that was made, that was a political piece of art. That art must have driven the change. Because we're, you know, we're narrative beings, we, we remember stories, we remember artwork, we look back at the 60s and we think about the protest music. I suspect, and again, like I'm not, I'm not carrying the evidence for this, and hopefully everyone disagrees with me. But I suspect the art was peripheral to those changes. I think social change comes from organising, and it comes from political activism. And I think the kinds of art that has the best chance of changing, the kinds of theatre that has the best chance of changing, is the is the people on the street activism, the organising, the actual direct engagement with the political process. I don't think it's coming from any of the arts. I don't think it's coming from the museum sector or from the theatre arts or from music. I wish it was, um, but I feel like I have been asked by so many scientists, would you need to make the art that's gonna connect with people? Um, and I just don't think that's the way to make an artwork that's good, or at least I wasn't able to make anything that I could stand behind. Sorry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, you and Alex can have a fist fight uh, in the car park. Uh, <laughs> In we'll about 10 minutes. On country. And look, um, we, we've got about five minutes or so left, and I really do want to very quickly, uh, and the man who loaned me a hat might get a very, very quick question in. But um, could you please introduce yourself and um, share with us what's on your mind? Hi, my name is Kirsten. Um, and hey, Kirsten. And, um, so I think about the phrase, under capitalism, there is no ethical consumption a lot because every choice we make has an ethical consequence. And it makes me wonder about how, as artists, how we can make our work ethical and will it ever be fully ethical? Thank you so much. Did it, does anyone want to you know, jump into an ethical a response on this question of ethics? It, it depends on how you're going to define Ethical, we're all implicated. We're all 
we, we are all implicated and there's no way of not being a part of a very, um, you know, like, it, yeah, it's about the relationality and the responsibility and the locatedness of how you engage and ask for change. And I agree with the comments before. I think um, participation and collectivity is definitely the key. When you see massive change happening globally, it's because people decide, and whether or not that's violent or what we, we are very powerful collectively. At, and when people decide that they want change and they force that, you can see that um, images and stories can really drive that. How those, how those ideas are communicated becomes really, really important. Everyone makes bad art at the beginning of their artistic career. It's part of learning how to tell stories and you have to make mistakes. You do have to make mistakes and you have to kind of put your voice out there. That's part of what you learn when you are practicing um, engaging in communicating. And it's really important that we encourage everyone to communicate about how what is happening and feel empowered about that communication. So from my perspective, it's really important to think about what is important about what we need to communicate about and how are we doing that and how can we harness that and engage in mistake making and loving each other in that process because that's the only way. It can't just be privileged voices that feel confident enough to have their voice out there. People need to be able to be encouraged that what they have to say is important, that how they feel is important and that also the planet and where you live is really important. Yeah. And anyway. Thank you. And uh, now I won't name the particular person but uh, Someone here classified themselves as a professional talker, and uh, we're very, very interested in this conversation. I'm quite mindful of the time as well. So what, what I'd really like to do, and I understand, uh, you know, that um, buffet tingling has now probably subsided and you're keen to get up and moving. So if we could just very quickly have a, um, just one quick um, query or comment and quick response, and then I do really want to just very quickly go with the panel on some fine suggestions for you to take into your world. So please, um, introduce yourself. Uh, Neil Arfield here. Uh, look, David, I'm, I'm kind of also uh, a bit um, shocked at, uh, at, at your uh, depression about, about the role of art in all this. Uh, surely art is a conversation. It's a place of, of, of dreaming for our society. It's a place, uh, it's a place where the soul of the, of the country grows and gathers. Your play, Kill or Climate Deniers, has been a remarkably important uh, piece of that conversation uh, in the places where it's, where it's been performed. Uh, you know, Jermaine Greer's The Female Eunuch might not have caused uh, the, uh, the, uh, the results of feminism at the, uh, you know, in the, across the, the last decades of the 20th century, but it was, such a crucial part of the debate. The, the, the protest songs of the 60s might not have um, you know, finished America's involvement in the Vietnam War, but they were, they were crucial to, the, uh, to giving heart to the people that were fighting for that. Surely the two things go hand in hand. If you, if you came to the Adelaide Festival and you saw uh, Dimanche, uh, the, this beautiful Belgian show about climate change uh, two years ago, performed in, in, in ways that, that broke the hearts of everyone who was seeing it. Surely they, they, your, 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 your energy is gathered by that. They, they go hand in hand. I don't think you can, you can say art has no effect. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Neil, and I, I, I did see me live. Um, I, wonderful to hear that, that passionate entreaty. Uh, I'm very, I'm going to indulge one more, I, I think we're done. Uh, very quickly, very quickly. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Maria Zotti, um, and I manage Parklands and Sustainability for the City of Adelaide, Kyoto. And um, following on from what Neil said, I am involved in responding to the climate crisis through politics, legislation, policy, and projects. And the work you're doing is really important, and it 
um, you know, those creative responses through storytelling, um, exposing us to different um, perspectives, I've enjoyed it as a station. Um, they're the things that enable me to keep going in my team. And for those big visions and ideas and small, intimate examples that you see through a Netflix show um, or through community projects, um, make me feel connected to the bigger picture and to the story and enables me to keep doing what I'm doing. So it is important. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I'm so, so happy. I, you can have one sentence. I, I, absolutely. One quick sentence, please. <laughs> and then we do need to wrap it up. Zero population growth. That is a great question for us to all discuss over the break, I think, um, because that's a big question. Thank you so much. Okay. This has been very stimulating, and I'm going to let you have the last word, David. All right, but but first, <laughs> what have you got? What have you got in your grab bag of goodies to share with these wonderful people? Uh, something they can do, something they can take away, something they can see, mm -hmm. just very quickly. Caitlin, would you like to? Yeah. Let her in. Um, come see. You're all invited to my son Samuel's fourth birthday party. Da -da -da -da. Uh, we're down at the mill. We've had our first week cancelled because my one of my actors was a close contact. None of us have COVID, thank, thankfully. Um, so we're on next week. Uh, that'll be emailed out to you. Um, and then I have a brain. Go check out Future Earth on Instagram if you haven't yet. Um, there's a show on before us called Auto Eulogy, which is by Lucy Half Hennessy. Her, her brain is so good. Um, if you want to see more independent work by people based here who are making works about the climate crisis and the independent theatre scene. Um, and then go get educated, particularly around COP26. One of the things that we emailed out is a specific link to a podcast episode by or Gimlet Media's How to Save a Planet um, that is specifically talking about COP26 and the decisions that were and weren't made there and how they were made. Um, and go read a book by Becky Chambers <laughs> that I can't remember the name of right now, but there's a lot of cool, really speculative fiction out there, particularly spec written by First Nations authors, um, which is very cool, but I can't name any of them right now off the top of my head. Um, there was a final one, and it's gone. That's and we've it. got the links so we can share yeah. those too. Yeah. Thanks, Caitlin. Woo. Okay. okay, Ali, keep it going. Okay. Move on. I just wanted to respond as well to Neil. I heard Tom Gara um, defending history yesterday, and you know, like it's easy to defend your discipline, but I think that part of our job as well is to consider how we undiscipline our areas of knowledge and think about interdisciplinarity and also about justice of story and justice of voice. And I think that for a long time, there's been a very white lens of uh, history, storytelling, disciplining of knowledge, and indigenous peoples and vulnerable peoples. Uh, like I listened to people yesterday, um, to refugees who escaped from Manus Island and ended up in New Zealand and Canada, and talking about how we're one day gonna have a Royal Commission about the way we've been treating people in this country, but indigenous peoples, this planet, every you know, like we need to really think about whose voices are being heard. And so, my urge is for everyone to kind of listen to the voices that we're not find those voices that we're not necessarily hearing, and make sure that we are engaging in in thinking about justice in the the ethical underpinning of what we're doing. So thank you. So Mara, what you got? Uh, so the obvious thing is make a climate badge, um, but I think at this particular day and time and country and state, the more important thing is maybe to vote and think about how you're voting um, with the climate crisis in mind. And I think, yeah, I need to do more research on that, but um, yeah, I think that's something that we all need to be thinking about in the next few weeks. Um, I will mention a couple of other shout outs. So most of our collective is involved in an exhibition called Neoteric, which is over at the Adelaide Rail Station. Um, at the moment, part of the Adelaide Festival as well. Uh, and one of our members, Sarah Waters, is part of the Adelaide Biennial, and she's talking this afternoon, five o'clock, over at Regattas, just on the other side um, of the main road here. 
um, with a couple of other people from Adelaide Biennial as well about what's going on over there. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, okay, so um, there's a, an Adelaide collective called um, Kinetic Collective who are doing a production of a piece of mine called Kill Climate Deniers at the State Theatre in, in September, which is in a few months, but they're also, some of the members are also involved in a group called Bait Bridge who are performing here mm -hmm. this afternoon. Um, in terms of practical action, uh, I mean, definitely, if you're not already, and I'm sure most of the people here are, but if you're not already, be supporting Seed Mob. Um, shout out to the Wangan and Jagaling who traditional owners council were still uh, on like year five of facing down Madani, haven't stopped. Um, mostly though, I think I'd, I'd, Tamara's phrase is the best, just keep going, you all know what to do. <laughs> there's, there's no one here, there's so many places. This, it's such a multifaceted crisis, but it means there's a multifaceted solution. Everyone here knows what to do, just keep going, you're doing great. Fantastic. Oh, please give everybody a round of applause. Thank you so much. And uh, look, if you want to linger here on this stage at uh, one o'clock, is a, um, a wonderful thing to be involved in called Can I Live? And also on the Plane Tree stage, there's a deep dive into divestment or a dive into deep divest. Whatever it is, it's about money and where you don't put it, and I think that'll be a really fantastic discussion as well. So please, I'll see you out there. And thank you so much, it's been a really brilliant um, interactive mob. Right.